momentous night of Sunday, the 29th of December, 1940, from shortly after six o'clock until half past ten, the German Air Force carried out one of the most devastating fire-raising raids of the war. Continuously for four and a half hours, their main target was an area particularly vulnerable to fire, the City of London, an area that is often taxed to the considerable resources of the London Fire Brigade, even in peacetime. These grim scenes, reminiscent of the Great Fire of London nearly three centuries ago, were taken from the roof of St Paul's. They embraced the area from St Paul's Churchyard to Newgate Street, Paternoster Row, Ave Maria Lane, and the Stationers' Hall. In fighting the fires, 16 firemen were killed, 11 by high explosive bombs and 5 by falling walls. The injured numbered over 250. No fewer than 1,500 appliances were used, including 100-foot steel water towers, pumps, hose lorries, water units, petrol wagons, and other types of machines. Every one of these appliances was controlled throughout the night and ordered to its correct destination by the central control room, working in collaboration with its subsidiary district controls. <laughs> Message from a team at the control. A heavy incendiary bombing raid has occurred in the city area. Many large fires are in progress and rapidly spreading. All available appliances have been ordered out. Order 50 pumps from the to St Paul's Churchyard. 50 pumps from the A to West Cliff Field. All the report to control points, 100 pumps from the E to 60 station to stand by. One of the many historic buildings attacked was the parish church of St. Lawrence Jury, where a service is held just before the election of the Lord Mayor of London at the Guildhall. St. Bide's Church in Fleet Street, one of the most beautiful of Wren's masterpieces, suffered very badly, and little more than the bare shell now remains. No water system yet devised will supply the quantity of water required to put out a fire of such magnitude. Most of the water had to be relayed from the River Thames up to a mile away. It was made all the more difficult by the fact that it was dead low water at the time, and the relaying crews had to get their hose ashore across the treacherous mud flats from fireboats in midstream. Hose laying lorries, each carrying 6,000 feet of three and a half inch hose, laid out relay lines at the rate of 20 miles an hour. Down with the pot. The spread of fire through the narrow streets was helped by a strong southwest wind, and in places the flames raced along as fast as a man could run. The areas affected consisted mainly of shop and warehouse property, too small to come within the scope of the regulations enforcing a system of fire protection. Most of the buildings contained valuable stock. They were securely locked and bolted, and only a few had caretakers to deal with fires or to open up the heavy doors to the firemen. Space in the city had been so valuable in past years that small courtyards at the back of many warehouses 
have been roofed with glass and filled with inflammable material that made them fatally easy targets for incendiary bombs. Besides the raging inferno you see here now, nearly 1,500 other fires were dealt with in London alone on this same night. were also raging across the river in Southwark, or as it's usually called, the Borough. The large industrial district of warehouses, wharves and factories, adding yet more fuel to the all-engulfing fire. In spite of the great shortage of water and the high wind, the fire was confined to the buildings you see here. A fierce, cutting wind caused streams of sparks to fly among the fighters and dense volumes of acrid smoke almost choked them. There were over a hundred cases of conjunctivitis and other eye injuries that needed urgent treatment. The mains in this area normally have a pressure of 40 pounds and it's as much as two men can do to hold a branch. But on this fateful night, a trunk main had been fractured by high explosive and the tremendous amount of water drawn off for other fires left nothing but feeble jets. Here again, a lot of valuable time was taken up in relaying water from the Thames and other static sources. Vital water mains had been blasted by high explosive and thousands of sprinklers and drenchers, powerless to check the flames, wasted water which turned into steam almost as soon as it was ejected from the sprinkler heads. The fire was stopped at the Old Bailey. Next morning every fire was in hand, though the streets affected presented a scene of tragic desolation. The magnitude of the task confronting the fire service can be gauged by the fact that if all the pumps engaged had been able to work to full capacity, not less than 600,000 gallons of water per minute would have been required. The Guild Hall, with its fine banqueting chambers and frescoed walls, was severely damaged. The 
nearby church of St. Lawrence Jury was almost destroyed. White Cross Street in the city was a veritable death trap. Debris was everywhere. Both ends of the street were blocked. The water mains were empty and the appliances had to be abandoned. The men had to make their getaway over the railway bridge and there were many narrow escapes. The night of this great fire was a time of severe trial for men of the fire service. The brigade pays tribute to their work and mourns the loss of so many of its comrades. Goodbye, firemen. We will finish the job for you. However many of our stations are bombed and broken up, our spirit will never be broken. Look out, Hitler. We saved the old Bailey that night. <laughs>